JM on Cars is sponsored by Car Vertical. With just a registration number, or even better, a VIN, Car Vertical will search over 20 European databases to find out whether any car you're looking at has a hidden past. They can see if a vehicle was used as a taxi, stolen, suffered fire damage, or involved in a crash, even when it wasn't written off, so could pass other checks. Car Vertical is now an essential tool in my car buying kit, putting all the information I need to know together in one easy to read report. Even better, if you follow the link in the description down below, you'll get 10% off. A big thank you to them for being today's sponsor. Hello everybody, today I am driving perhaps the most underrated of all modern supercars, the second generation Honda NSX. And really this is actually an Acura, it is a product both in design and manufacturing terms of Honda North America. It is their flagship car. And what a thing it is too. Somehow though, they appear to have gotten it completely and totally wrong. The original is regarded by many as a masterpiece, and although I'm not its biggest fan, I can see completely why. This though, in sequel terms, was about as popular as Return to Oz, only without the terrifying things on roller skates. I have heard a huge number of reasons as to why you would not want to buy one of these. Many of them centre around the badge on the front. No, it's not a Ferrari or a Lamborghini, but then Honda has plenty of racing pedigree, so I don't buy that. And there's also plenty of very wealthy Honda fans out there. The interior also gets a lot of stick, and yeah, sure, there are bits in it that feel a little bit low rent. Some of it's very civic. However, supercars always did pick pieces from much cheaper cars. You get in a Ferrari 355, you'll find old Fiat indicator stalks. Actually, again, a 430, you'll find old Fiat indicator stalks, cheap switches that go sticky in your hands and all that stuff, and that never stopped anybody buying one of those. A Lamborghini Diablo has Morris Ital indicator stalks, and yet they're worth 200 grand 20 years later. For some, I know that the performance was deemed inadequate. This car puts out 580 horsepower, but because it's very heavy, it's only as quick as a Nissan GTR. The thing is, though, a Nissan GTR is really quite fast, and it's the way that this car delivers its power is what makes it so interesting. Behind me, you will find a 3.5 litre, 75 degree V6 twin turbo, which produces about 500 horsepower. Joining that are a trio of electric motors, one at the back and two at the front. That means that not only can this car do real, genuine torque vectoring, total torque is around the sort of 460 pound foot mark. If you added the power output of the electric motors and the combustion engine together, you would get far more than 600 horsepower. But because of the way each of them deliver their own power, Honda said, no, the peak combined output is 580. This is a hybrid and it can indeed drive on purely electric power, but not for very long. This is another reason I think the car perhaps failed, because the battery pack is only about 1.3 kilowatt hours. That means the range is next to nothing. The electric motors are here to fill in the torque gap left by the turbo as it spools up. And I have to say, they work really, really well. Just driving this car along at normal speeds, it does feel really properly special. And this, for me, is the first reason why it should be considered not just a real proper supercar, but a supercar that you should think about buying. This looks amazing. This particular example has been brought to me by its kind owner, Raymond. It's his first supercar after a series of Porsches, and he bought it at auction last year. It's not the spec that I would go for. I'd have it in the blue or perhaps the red, and I would definitely need to have the little carbon spoiler at the back that really gives the body just that touch of aggression I think it's missing in standard guys. However, these are still a fairly dramatic thing, a little bit fussy in places. However, I will say that in the flesh, they are much, much better than in photos. The thing that will also surprise you is just how small and compact they are. Driving this along, I feel like I'm in something really quite dainty. It's almost lotus-like in its proportions. 
and the way that it drives is so so very easy for such a technological overload you could think it would be a little bit unwieldy and this was also a, a source of some interesting debate because magazines that tested this when they came out a few years ago generally reached one of two conclusions and oddly for the same reason what they would say is here is a car which has all these electric motors a brake by a wire whole host of stuff going on yet it doesn't really feel like it adds to the experience therefore we don't like it other magazines will then say, ah, oh, well, here's a car with lots of electric motors, brake by wire, and all this extra stuff, but you don't notice it, which means it doesn't detract from the experience, and that's why we like it. It is a very special thing. It is superb to drive. I think it got a better reception in America, whether that's the sort of home turf advantage, I, I couldn't say. But here, Giorno seemed lukewarm to the new NSX. It took a very, very long time before I got a chance to sample one myself. I was going to drive Honda UKs, but it met an unfortunate end. Then it took a very, very long time for them to get another one, and they don't really like to let it out. I did get a brief go in one in Miami, and that left me with just the, the tiniest taste of what the car was capable of. It was a really exciting thing, but Miami is not a great place to test a supercar. I know it's where most of them wind up living, but in terms of enjoyment as a driver, <laughs> it's one of the worst places you'll ever find. So I am very, very grateful to Raymond for bringing this car out to me to finally, once and for all, try on some real proper roads and decide whether this car deserves to sit alongside the true supercar Glitterati. In one regard, this car has most Ferraris and Lamborghinis really beat, and that's rarity. According to Wikipedia, and I will accept that is a dubious source, in 2020, not a great year for car sales in general, in Europe, whether we count as part of that anymore, I don't know, Honda sold, are you ready for this? Eight. I can believe that. That's a number I can actually go, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I kind of get it. The problem is, you see, that these are really expensive. You option one up and you're looking at 180,000 quid. And then, about a year later, if you actually want to sell it, you'd be lucky to get about half that. That means that these depreciate so violently, they make a brand new McLaren look like sound financial investment. So, enough waiting, let's see what Honda's finest is like on a brilliant road. Absolutely magnificent. As a daily drivable supercar, it's sensational. Now, a McLaren is definitely going to be faster. In some of the tighter sections, despite the car's torque vectoring, the weight of it does take over and you feel it struggling just a little bit. It does begin to overload those front tires. But considering how many parts of this are completely bespoke, it comes together so very well. It's not the quickest, it, it really isn't, but it's got more than enough poke to excite. It actually sounds all right from in here too. The V6 isn't the most tuneful, but it's not horrid to listen to. Response is absolutely incredible. The electric motors actually do the thing Honda said they do. 
What also impresses is this gearbox. And for one very simple reason, this is a nine speed dual clutch. Yes, dual clutches should always be very good. However, I don't know of any other car where this gearbox is used. The engine is the same way too. It's a sort of distant relative of some that Honda put in some of the American market cars, but I don't think there's another 75 degree V6 that Honda build. So you've got a completely bespoke engine and gearbox in this car. There is a brilliant documentary out there about the production facility in Ohio which builds these cars and they are put together in a way that I can only describe as Japanese. To give you some ideas, this engine is absolutely brilliant. Like all good supercar engines, it sits impossibly low. The top of it is lower than the tops of the rear wheels. They put it together using torque wrenches, which are digital. They are linked up to a computer. So when your engine is assembled, it records the torque setting of every single individual bolt in the entire thing. So if ever down the line you have any problems, they can go back, check your build sheets, and they know exactly to what specifications your car was made. Brilliant. overtaking, absolutely effortless. It also doesn't shriek and scream and announce its arrival like a V12 Lamborghini, and I like that very much. As a daily drivable thing, that's exactly what you want. Means you can enjoy a road like this without feeling like you've disturbed everybody else who's trying to do the same thing. The engine also gets run in when it's built, and after they've done that, Honda have several different weights of bolts that they can put to make sure that it's absolutely perfectly balanced. You do get the feeling that with one of these, they don't really go wrong all that often. And that's a good thing, because unfortunately, one of the downsides of an NSX is that there are only two places in the whole country that can service them, and they're both in London. There was apparently an argument between the two sites because Honda gave its flagship store the rights to everything NSX and then one just down the road said, but hang on a minute, we actually sell more cars than them. We want to do the NSX as well. brakes are brilliant. As mentioned earlier, they're brake by wire, so there's no physical connection between me and the pedal. I do believe Dario Franchitti actually helped develop this system, and I've got to say, it's really good. I flippin' love this car. Yes, there are others which will give you more theatre, more bluster, more presence, perhaps a little bit more of a, a special interior. As a driving experience though, this is wonderful. The steering is really good. It's got texture, it's got feel, the weighting's really nice. Is it the best ever? I don't know. Is it better than the original NSX's? Going to be controversial here and say yes. The suspension is set up really nicely. There are a whole bevy of driving modes, and they change the powertrain, the all-wheel drive system, stability control, the suspension, and the steering. So I'm going to put the car now into quiet mode. I'm going to put it in. I'm going to put it in automatic. Now we're just driving along gently here, minding our own business, just being nice and calm and quiet and collected. And, can enjoy the scenery, visibility out is great, because Honda built this little A-pillar here out of some really special metal that meant they could make it a little bit thinner than the rest of the car. It's one of these things where you can look at the numbers and you can very, very easily dismiss this car, but to do so, you would be an absolute fool. In typical Honda fashion, even the stuff you don't really expect them to get right is absolutely brilliant. The action on these gear shift paddles, just the right amount of notchiness to make you feel like you're actually involved in a mechanical process. These seats, they don't really look like much at all, but they have plenty of adjustment in them, they are supremely comfortable, and they hold you in really nicely. They're so good that you don't really think about them at all, and that's how good seats should be. In fact, the whole car's really like that. You just sort of forget about everything happening under you. It just all comes together in one marvellously orchestrated symphony. This is a really, really badly paved section of tarmac, and the NSX is taking it just brilliantly. Eight. How could they sell only eight? Look, I think it's a pretty simple thing. 
the interest and the desire was just so that they were always going to depreciate that badly and very, very few people would be willing to put their hands in their pockets and say, you know what, I'm going to be happy to lose a hundred thousand quid on this car. Yes, a McLaren is a lot faster. Yes, a Ferrari has a sexier badge. In practice, it's actually probably going to be cheaper to run a new Ferrari than it would have been a new one of these over the first sort of two or three years. Ferrari ownership is also probably a little bit easier. They know what they're doing. Honda dealers in general are just a little bit strange. Having only two in this country in London was a mistake. They should have put one in Manchester or Edinburgh or even Birmingham. Like, just give people half a chance. I feel like this is a car which was just, just doomed. Yet, I feel I'm in that camp where I say this is a car that is on one hand, just a technological tour de force. It's amazing, the amount of stuff that goes into this. I'm now just coasting along in EV. I've not even got the engine on. It's it's wonderful, it's quiet, it's smooth. I feel like I just slipped past this little village. Oh, someone there had a, a Mark I MR2. Beautiful looking thing, red, look pristine. Uh, where's reverse? It's, oh, it's there. See, the car goes into reverse nice and easily. Got reversing camera, which is a little bit low res, bit of a shame that. The engine does start up a little bit earlier than you would want it to because it simply doesn't have the battery power to do much without it. The car is also a little bit short on boot space, but then compared with the Lamborghini Huracan, I think it's probably better. And nobody seems to complain about those. I'm sure there are plenty of people who just looked at the numbers, looked at the price and just went, nah. Why on earth would you pay so much more money for a car that's only as quick as a Nissan GTR? Look, a Nissan GTR is a lovely thing. I, I really, really enjoy them. But this is a real, genuine, bona fide supercar. It is an amazing, incredible piece of engineering. Yes, it's very Japanese. They made some mistakes with it. In 2018, they did update it a little bit. They didn't give it any more power, but they made it a lot quicker with some suspension changes. There's some very, very minor cosmetic tweaks, put better tires on it, that sort of thing. And they are maybe a little bit better, but not really enough to write home about. If I was Honda, I'd be very, very deeply upset that they put all this effort into building a car only to have it ignored because it is brilliant. Fuel economy, we don't know. Not very good, I think is the, uh, is the official answer. If you watched my Lamborghini Huracan Evo review, you would know that speed of these things is actually largely irrelevant because on this particular road, there is a man with a GR Yaris and he's faster than you. He's definitely faster than me. I have just bought myself a supercar. But if that hadn't worked out, and one of these was up for sale in the spec I wanted, I think this is what I would have bought. I had plans to, it's just that as a YouTuber, I do always have to have one eye on the, the business side of things. And business with Ferrari is a little bit better and easier than business with Honda. Because the tragic shame is that if I did go and buy something like this, well, what would I buy next from them? That, that's it, isn't it? It's, it's done. You've, you've had it. You've had the car. Whereas with Ferrari, there's this whole catalogue of other amazing things I could change and upgrade to. Brakes are brilliant. These aren't even the ceramics either. They were optional. Damping is really good. Suits this road so well. It does rotate under you a little bit. This is Raymond's first supercar. <laughs> And I feel like perhaps the greatest tragedy here is that he hasn't had something else before because he won't have the context of just how good this thing is. There will be very few people watching this video who actually own one of these. And I'm sure they're all sat at home going, yeah, you tell him, James, you tell him. I've been saying to everyone for years how brilliant this car is. But you know what? Between you and me, I almost feel bad about this because I kind of want to keep this secret. I've noticed in the last few months, prices have risen dramatically here in the UK. You used to be able to pick one of these up for about 75K. Now you're looking at closer to 95. Are they gonna keep going up? I don't know, but they absolutely should. Because what 
Honda gave the world here was a gift. Thank you. Thank you, Honda. I appreciated it. Anyway, huge thank you to Raymond for bringing his car out. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.